Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, Wh wherever you are. Uh, my name is Simon Timpley. I'd like to welcome you to edition 42 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Today's guest speaker is Cornelius Hugo, uh, Global Innovation Manager at AIB International. And today, Cornelius is going to be talking about the Foreign Supplier Verification Program for Food Importers. I'll just read you a little synopsis. FDA's rule on Foreign Supplier Verification Programs, that's FSVPs for short, for importers of food was finalized in November 2015. Uh, the compliance dates for some businesses begin in May 2017, so not too long to prepare. Uh, the rule requires that importers perform certain risk-based activities to verify that food imported into the U.S. has been produced in a way that meets U.S. safety standards. So today we're going to learn about FSVP, the objectives and requirements and the consequences of failing to comply and challenges for meeting this new rule. So another interesting subject, one that I don't know anything about. Most of the subjects every week I don't know anything about, so I'm going to learn something today and I hope you will too. I'd like to thank at this point the sponsors of the Food Safety Fridays, uh, Trace Analytics, Safe Food 360, Metal of Toledo and FSSC 22000. These companies help to bring these webinars to you free of charge every week and provide some free learning and a free certificate of attendance. Um, also, Cornelius, you know, uh, if you could just stop sharing so I could uh, say hello to you, uh, Cornelius. Um, thank you, Cornelius yeah. today. Uh, you're on uh, sharing at the moment, your PowerPoint, if you could just uh, stop sharing um, yeah, and go sure. back on webcam. Uh, Cornelius, are you, you're in Kansas, that's right, today? That is correct, yeah, in the middle of Kansas, in a little village called Manhattan, Kansas. Lovely, Man and you t the, the sun's shining, you brought the sunshine. Well, yeah, we're having a sort of a weird winter here. We should be, I think, uh, 15 below centigrade, and we are roughly uh, 15 above centigrade, and we have been doing that for all February. So we're wondering what's going on. So as, yeah. a, as, as a person, I love it, but it's not good for our agriculture. No. Um, it's probably the power of the Food Safety Fridays. We always bring sun wherever we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you can get your PowerPoint ready, Cornelius, I'll just uh, tell the audience about next week's webinar. Um, Very good. Ladies and gents, the, the bad news is there is no Food Safety Fridays webinar next week. Oh, dear. The good <clears throat> news is we've got a four-hour training webinar. The bad news is it's not free to attend. But the good news is it's only $97. So if you do want to attend that, uh, it's assessing threats and vulnerabilities for food defense to meet the requirements of GFSI standards. In a lot of um, uh, uh, the standards, BRC and things like that, now you've got uh, strong requirements for threat analysis. They talk about TACCP, a new acronym, uh, acronym threat analysis, critical control points. Um, so. Next week's webinar, uh, training webinar, is four hours. It's to talk about that. There'll be some um, templates given out and a certificate as well and a little short end test. So have a look at that. And if you want to register, please do so. We'll be back the week after that with another free Food Safety Fridays webinar. Um, that's it. Uh, I just need to say we are recording today. The slides and recording and, and everything will be handed out later. We'll send an email to all registrants so you'll get that. We've got some polls and questions that we'd like you to partake in throughout the webinar today. Um, I'll be there at the appropriate point to help with those. Apart from that, enjoy the webinar. It's over to Cornelius. Okay, it's over to you, Cornelius. Okay, thank you so very much and uh, welcome everyone to the today's webinar. Uh, you say foreign supplier verification program and I can see from the list it's just all over the world and uh, I'm really glad to see this kind of a crowd because uh, probably this uh, this rule under the Foreign uh, Food Safety Modernization Act of, uh, of, uh, of FDA is going to have a huge impact in the food supply chains worldwide. So let, let's get started here and uh, 
uh, in the seminar. And uh, a little bit about myself. I have been with AIB uh, some 17 years, dedicated to food safety inspection, then HACCP, HACCP accreditation, and more than anything else, literally food safety education, and, and especially in all over Latin America. So my interest is to share with you our current understanding about this new rule. Uh, a little bit about AIB, all I want to say is the uh, in the second paragraph, our mission, that you, you say our intent is to empower clients worldwide to elevate the food safety and production process capabilities. Just a little explanation when about process uh, capabilities when to food safety morning as fewer and fewer failures related to food safety. So the next slide, hello. Three basic objectives uh, for today is consider and understand the reason why. It's very important to understand why this new rule, you know. And then uh, what are some of the basic requirements of the rule? We'll, we'll go mostly into it. And then at the very end, what, 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 what can we start doing here in this year, next year to get ready and to come into compliance as this rule uh, becomes effective really in May of 2017? For that, we have prepared the following content. Uh, let's understand why uh, the importance of the food imports and then the objectives of this rule. The key definitions, which uh, I will define them for you and with you and understand the importance. And then what are the, some of the standard requirements that, that both importers and exporters of food and food ingredients and raw materials will have to uh, be compliant with. And then there are some modified requirements consequences of not uh, complying timelines and then our challenges okay now you can read those numbers there and say yeah those are big numbers you know we import from 150 countries and nearly 300,000 food facilities but I think a better way of understanding why uh, the foreign supplier verification program came about is if uh, everybody were to just uh, close your eyes for a minute, just close your eyes, especially those uh, listeners there in the United States, just close your eyes, uh, have faith, there's nothing I can do to hack you uh, <laughs> from here. So <laughs> just close your eyes, open up your refrigerator and look at the refrigeration side. And, and if, if you see uh, an imported food item there, go ahead and open open your eyes, okay? Okay, so the next question I'm gonna ask you, okay, now why don't those that still have your eyes closed, why don't you open the freezer side of your refrigerator and food item in there? Now, I, 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 I put a wager that the listeners, especially in the United States, uh, do have their eye closed but let's move on a little bit uh, look around your kitchen your kitchen counter and and look at uh, what kind of fruits uh, do you have on your kitchen counter and and you have a, an imported fruit there just go ahead and close your eyes uh, i mean open your eyes <laughs> and then go into your kitchen cabinet and open the place where you keep your spices you know and again you know, if you see a, an imported spice uh, uh, open your eyes and, and by now I think everyone everyone has open eyes and that's a sort of a funny way of fun way of demonstrating why the foreign supply verification program is so important nowadays for the United States and why it came to be under the Food Safety Modernization Act so there are two objectives uh, and they're exactly the same as for any food plant in the United States is to just make sure that imported food is as safe as the one that is manufactured and sold in the United States. And the second one is to prevent potentially to be put into commerce, whether it is in the United States or whether it exports in the United States, does not matter. It's just we want to prevent potentially adulterated product from getting to the consumer. Now, those two dates that you see on the left and the right of the picture are very important. The final rule was published November 27th of last year, and on about roughly most everybody will have up to a year and a half to come into compliance. Now, don't think that is a long time, okay? A year and a half is truly not a long time. And I think you will agree with me after we have reviewed the rule and the requirements of the rule. Now, what are the key requirements of the rule? 
every rule here, at least in the United States, in the preamble or in, in subpart A, as they say, they, they always talk about the intent and scope, but then they define a lot of things that are then subject to the rule. And here are a couple of key definitions that please listen to very carefully because you must understand who you are in terms of this rule. So the first definition is that defines the foreign supplier. As you can see, it doesn't say the exporter. It says the supplier. So is your supplier the one that made your food and processed the food and sent it to you? Is your supplier whoever uh, raised the animal, let's say raised a tilapia and process and send it to you? Or is your supplier somebody that harvested a food and sent it to you? Think a strawberry, think a banana, think a mango, think, think a pineapple, okay? So you really need to know who truly the supplier is because the one that is exporting to you may not be and quite often will not be. So think foreign supplier. That's the first thing that you need to analyze and make sure that you know who is your foreign supplier. The second definition then leads into who is the importer then on this side that is in the United States. And there are only three possibilities. Under the rule, an importer can be the owner of the food. That is, Cornelius bought the food and he's importing it from X country. So Cornelius is the importer. But there may be nobody owning the food, but there may be a consignee. It has been consigned to somebody, to an entity, to Cornelius. So in that case, then Cornelius as a consignee is the importer. And the third possibility is that there is no consignee, there is no owner, but there is an agent of that foreign supplier in the United States. And that happens quite often. You know, big food firms have offices in Miami, say New York, LA, whatever. And so these are then the legal representatives of that foreign supplier in this country. And then they will be responsible then for verifying that the food was produced in accordance with the relevant food safety regulations. In other words, one of those three will be held accountable by the FDA if something goes wrong with the imported food or raw material or ingredient and you have a failure that leaves. The FDA is not going to go calling on the foreign supplier. The FDA is going to go calling on the importer. So you need to realize that is a huge, huge change. The importers will be held accountable for the food safety of whatever they bring into the United States. Now reflect on that. That is nothing different than from a manufacturer in the United States receiving somebody, something sourced within the United States. They will be also be held accountable if they don't follow through with the same regulations. Then the next slide, we have a poll and I turn it over back to Simon who will gonna help us uh, with the poll. But the poll is very simple. At, at this stage, pull a little bit who is involved with this rule, uh, the importer and the foreign supplier. A quick question I have for all the listeners is, think, how many, how many foreign suppliers in foreign countries or importer in the United States do you think are aware of this foreign supplier verification program at this stage and have begun to think about it? What am I going to do about it? So think quickly through and, and let me know. You think most of them already know, are aware of it, are doing something about it, or yeah, it's, it's only some, you know. Or how many of you do you think that uh, nobody or very few, or boy, this is so new to me. Uh, so we're gonna give you a little bit of time to think it through and bring back your answers. And, and Simon is going to share them with them before we continue with the, uh, with the, with the webinar. Yeah, uh, I've loaded that poll in the sidebar, Cornelius. So okay. um, hopefully you can see that. We've got um, the attendees voting and uh, it's coming out around 56% saying some of them, 32% few of them and 13% most of them. So the majority are 
I'm thinking some of them probably know, and uh, a large okay. proportion, few of them. Mm. Okay, okay. Well, I, I'm glad that at least some of them <laughs> have heard of that. Okay, so it, it's better to have that number than a fewer number. So I encourage every listener that knows about uh, other colleagues in the food business exporting to the United States or, or in the United States importing to, to spread out the word, guys. Uh, something new is coming in, something very powerful is coming in. We need to get ready for it, okay? So are we ready to move on then to the next slide? Yeah. Go, okay. go ahead, Cornelius. Okay. So now, like like every rule, there are some exemptions. And we, and we need to understand what, what, what the word exemption means, okay? And there, the first thing you can see that juice and seafood are subject to regulated hazard. So now... Are they, sub, are, are they exempt from the foreign supply verification program? No, no, they are not exempt from the foreign supply verification. They are just exempt from the harp C component of it because both juice and seafood are already subject to regulated HACCP. So what the foreign, what the importer and the foreign supplier will have to do is understand those rules very carefully and apply the verification activities associated with those regulated hazards under the foreign supplier verification program, okay? So you are not exempt, you're just subject to already uh, regulation that already exists. Okay? Then alcoholic beverages, they are not exempt, they're just subject to those regulations that apply to alcoholic beverage. Now, exempted food from the foreign supply verification program Yes, the following are exempt in that if you bring in food for research or evaluation, then there are regulations for those. I'm bringing this for research evaluation, so you're not subject to a lot of the standard foreign supplier verification uh, requirements. For personal consumption, you're not subject. If you bring something, you, you're flying into the United States, you're coming on a cruise ship, whatever it is, well, you're not subject to this rule. You'll be subject to to, to the regular customs rules at the airport or the port, okay? And then finally, if there is a food that is, say, coming from Mexico, transshipped through the United States up to Canada, then it is not subject because it is going through the United States, it's being transshipped over to Canada. So because it will be consuming Canada, it will be subject to the Canadian rules, not to the US rule. So I hope, I hope this is clearly understood what exempted food means, okay? On the next slides and the next series of slides, what we're going to talk about the standard phone supplier verification requirements. And again, given the time period, this uh, look at this as, as a summary of it. The standard requirements subject the importer to certain verifications activities, and we, we will review them, okay? These verifications activity have the intent that the imported food or the raw material or the ingredient and listen very carefully, food contact packaging material and food contact manufacturing material that they comply with the preventive controls rules. We're going to go through that in a minute. Preventive control rule is the new harp c hazard analysis and risk-based preventive control. If it is a manufactured process item or if you are importing ready to eat raw agriculture uh, material. Examples, a strawberry, a tomato, a cucumber, an avocado, a pineapple, a mango, okay? So these are raw agricultural commodities that normally will be eating in its raw state. An example that is not such an item would be a potato. Okay? We can import potatoes, but they won't be subject to certain standard requirements because you cook potatoes before you eat them, okay? So that is the famous produce rule. It applies to what we call produce, those items that are harvested and pretty much eating as, you har as, as they were harvested. Now, the third one is that the, pro the products imported must not be adulterated under Section 402 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. And it, it says very clearly that a food shall be considered as adulterated if in whole or in part contains something that is not that food or is otherwise unfit for human consumption. So the rule tries to prevent 
such food product from coming in such state to the United States. And finally, one of the most important thing is that it is not misbranding in regards to allergens, because that is the number one issue for food recalls in the United States is misbranded food items. Somebody forgot to put the right allergen, somebody to forgot to put it in the right legal manner. And you ask, you, how can it happen that so many food items are put in the market with wrong labels? So you will have to take a good hard look at your whole labeling control program, allergen control program, to assure that you don't put mislabeled food in the market in the United States because that will lead to an immediate recall. So now, in order to achieve those four things, then uh, the importer, she is the importer, must develop, maintain, and follow a standard foreign supplier verification program. We'll go into that. Now, before we go into that, let's understand those two words down there, independent and qualified. So the importer have to have either the capacity, him or herself, to do that, or you must have access to an entity, a person, uh, an institution, whatever that helps the importer meet those requirements. So it is key to understand those two words and you will understand it as we move forward. Independent means the person whoever develops, implement and manages this foreign supply verification program must be independent in terms of a financial potential conflict of interest with the foreign supplier. I think that that is easy to understand. I, I cannot have potential conflict of interest. What, but what, what, what qualified mean? I mean, who is qualified? Well, I hope that by the time we're through with this presentation, you will have understood very clearly what means to be qualified to undertake this foreign supplier verification program. So let's take a look what the importer will have to do. What are the standard requirements? The first thing is to do what they call a risk assessment. And you see there that it is composed of two things. And we'll go into them here in more detail because they're so important. Okay. And then come from that, then you will develop the appropriate verification activities of that foreign supplier. Okay. Plus the frequency with which you will undertake each one of, of those verification activities. Then the importer is also responsible for investigating if there is an issue. Say a complaint came in about the program. So you, well, we have a complaint. You pass it on to the, to the foreign supplier. No, 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 no. You, the importer, you are responsible to then follow up with that your foreign supplier and make sure corrective actions are undertaken to eliminate that failure. So that is the responsibility of the importer. And then the rule says every so often you will have to reassess the effectiveness of your program and you also must be identified with the FDA and finally uh, a little bit about record keeping which is something that is truly uh, remarkable under the Food Safety Modernization Act. So let's dive into those standard requirements. Now look at that word before importing. Before importing you have to, to undertake a hazard analysis of the product you're importing. Remember the, I, I said it could be a manufactured product, it could be an ingredient, it could be a fish, it could be juice, it could be uh, contact packaging material. Is that before importing, you say, well, I'm already importing. Well, then you have those 18 months, you see, to, <laughs> to make sure that that hazard analysis is completed, is done. More likely than not, maybe your foreign supplier already has it. But if you don't have it, you must make sure that you do this hazard analysis before this 18 months are over. Now, be before applies, well, I'm contemplating, uh, I want to have a new supplier, say, from country A, so I don't mention names, okay? Then before you approve that supplier, it's a new supplier, then you must do it before and not after, okay? So I hope we, we have understood. If it's ongoing business, you do it within the time frame. But if a new supplier comes on board, do it before you approve the supplier. Now, how many 
importers in the United States do you think are capable of doing? Well, some will be able, some won't be able. So you can rely on that hazard analysis made by somebody else, like your foreign supplier, or that foreign supplier had it done by a third party. You can review it. You can rely. The importer cannot say, okay, uh, Cornelius, my foreign supplier in country A did it, and we're okay. No, the importer must review my, my food safety plan and approve or disapprove it. So how many importers have that capacity? So you may have to rely then on a local uh, qualified individual to be able to do that for you as the importer if you are not capable of doing that. But it is the importer who has to sign off. You cannot delegate this responsibility to a third party. Then the second part of the risk assessment is now the hazard analysis uh, I went ahead of myself. Hazard analysis exemption. Again, like there are some exemption. Again, fruits and vegetables of low acid canned goods or microbiological analysis. They're already in compliance. See, low acid canned foods fall under a regulation, the 21 CFR Part 113, and produce safety rules is 21 CFR Part 112. So those two. Whoever is exporting to the United States under those rules, they're already complying with those rules. So you don't have to repeat that hazard analysis as related to microbiological issues. Because if they are exporting without having that and validating the effectiveness of that, it would be an illegal act. What you must verify as an importer is that they, all, they also conducted the other hazard analysis. Did they conduct a as an analysis for chemical issues, for foreign matter issues, that they, they conducted has analysis for the new hazard identified on the hard sea, such as radiological or economically motivated adulteration. So again, it's only an exemption in terms of biological concern as, as related to only produce and low acid canned food but the importer must also verify that the other hazards were also analyzed. Okay, on the next slide then comes the second part of the risk assessment. Again, I will not repeat the before. We understood that, it applies here. But now uh, the importer must also, okay, I have analyzed, say I'm importing uh, mill basmati rice, and that comes from different Asian countries. So if I did the hazard analysis on mill basmatis, right, that is a hazard analysis is good. It doesn't matter where the country the rice is coming from, but it, because it deals with a very specific product. But that is not the same when you evaluate your supplier. Even you may have two, three suppliers of the same product in the same country. Well, that doesn't mean that all three are equally effective, are equally good, are equally compliant. So the importer must also carry out a foreign supply evaluation of his or her compliance history. Okay, how effective are their processes? How effective are their food safety practices? Do they have really a complete food safety plan in their in their in their manufacturing facilities or in their fields? Okay, now are they complying with relevant FDA regulations because? Those are the ones that apply to the product if it's shipped to the United States. Okay, so are they? Uh, have they been subject to import alerts? Have they been subject to warning letters? So these are some of the things that the importer will have to ask their foreign suppliers. I need to know all that because did the FDA visit you within the last year? Say the answer is yes. Okay, did you get a form 483? Yes, I did. You know what? Send me a photocopy. I need to review that. It is the responsibility of the importer to review that and if there were issues where they correct it to the satisfaction of the FDA. Because if not, how can you approve such a supplier? See how strong it is. I hope you begin to understand, do I have a qualified individual to do this? Am I a qualified individual to do this? How am I going to go about this, okay? Now, there may be such other factors like a storage, for example, is the product you're bringing in subject to refrigeration, refrigerated conditions related to food safety? So how is that being handled? 
okay? Is the food product being uh, come in liquid bulk? Means very good. Are these dedicated containers? Potato containers? Are these containers properly clean and sanitized and maintained? So you must look also at the transport condition and refrigeration condition of whatever you bring in. So think again. Do I have the capacity? Yes or not? Okay. So now here I turn it over back to Simon. He can help us with the poll. He's setting it up now. I want each one to think through that for us here. And again, it's a, how many food imported in the United States do you think are capable of risk assessment? Remember, there were that related to the item will be importing. Do you think are capable of doing a true a profound evaluation of the compliance history of all my suppliers. And I guess some of you are looking up at the ceiling and say, oh my God, I got 12, I got 30 foreign suppliers. How am I going to do that? Okay. So why don't you give us uh, your thoughts on that? You think uh, most of you guys importing food are ready to go? Yes, we can do it. Or don't worry, Cornelius, uh, we have access to qualified individuals, okay? Some of you may think already, you know what? My foreign supplier is already certified under a GFSI scheme. And the question will be, okay, how sure are you that your GFSI scheme contains all the requirements of the foreign supplier verification program? You have to verify that that scheme does comply with that program, okay? And if you have that, then you have access to a qualified third party. So how are we coming along with that poll? Okay, uh, just before we go on to the poll, that sort of answers Pamela's questions in, in a way. Uh, she says, if my supplier is SQF certified, does it comply with the FSVP? Yeah, SQF. Great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and, and I guess I, I already answered the question. Yeah, uh, uh, let, me, let, let me answer it this way. All those private teams under the foreign, uh, under the uh, worldwide uh, global food safety initiatives, they are all adjusting those schemes to make sure that their schemes are in compliance with the, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Okay, because if they don't do that, well, they would have great volume and they would become irrelevant. Okay, so the answer is if your scheme complies with all the regulation of the Food Safety Modernization Act, then yes, then that can be used as a qualified input into doing both the, the risk assessment for the product and the 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 compliance history of your supplier however make sure you consult with whatever scheme certification body you're dealing with and ask them scheme is program is covered okay you cannot say must be able to demonstrate and cover. I hope I hope I uh, uh. Mm -hmm. okay uh, well yeah that's great the poll has come out most of them 21% some of them 44% and few of them 35% did you get that Cornelius sure. right okay Great news. That's great news. Price because a lot of food manufacturers in the United States, so they understand these concepts very well. Okay, it, it's it's when the when when the importer may be an intermediary. Okay, for example, if you buy from say quote unquote a broker, just to use a name. How sure are you that that intermediary that imported the food and you bought it from them is on top of this? So don't rely, don't rely, well, I am not the importer. I buy it from somebody who imported it. Hmm. 
I think in my case, I would get in touch with the, with the seller of that imported food and said, look, I need to verify with you that you have this program up, running, and managed well. So trust, but verify, OK? OK. All right. OK. Yep. OK, we continue on then. So if you did both of things, the risk analysis as well as the supply evaluation, then the rule says, OK, you must then execute certain verifications activity and get them. This must be written. The whole foreign supply verification form must be in writing, OK? And these are there to demonstrate that, first of all, you're using approved supplier. And I want everyone to underline that and put it, underline the approved supplier. It is critical that when you redo your receiving documentation at, at your facility in the United States, that the first thing the receiving personnel will ask, wait a minute, let's not do anything. Let's not even make sure that what shipping document comes from an approved supplier. Because if it does not come from an approved supplier, you better not unload. That is what is meant from approved supply when we talk about identification. Proof supplier is not, I have approved them because I did the risk analysis and then compliance. Demonstration of use means that you truly, whatever it's getting to your facility, comes from those suppliers and nobody else. So then you would say, oh my God, my current supplier approved supplier. There was a flood. Uh, can I use? Says, yes, you can. But listen carefully. If the word is temporary, okay? And temporary means a short period of time, okay, once or twice. But then you have to do special verification activities before you use that item you you bought or you imported from an unapproved supplier, such as sampling and testing, such as a certification from a third party, a quick one, okay? Such an uh, immediate audit to that unapproved supplier to really be somewhat sure that where you're buying it from has the right installation programs, processes, and, 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 and procedures, okay? Now, look at the lower part of this, of this slide because it's very important to understand it. The activities to assure identifies adequate, adequately control. Now, we have talked about the foreign supplier and we define the foreign supplier. But look at the second line. See, the hazard analysis done by your foreign supplier, you, the importer, could very associated with the product I'm sending you. You look, my supplier to the new concept of the program for the upstream program before you verification activity has your diary to include is that make sure was controlled by the supplier of your foreign supplier. Now, what happens if you, the importer, control the hazard? Could very well be. It has a biological hazard, and say you have a kill step to control that hazard. Then you, the importer, you will have your own HARP-C hazard analysis and risk-based preventive control, and you will have identified what that kill step will be, and you will have the documentation, and so on and so forth, and you will be, of, of course, subject to FDA inspection. But there are also food supply chains where neither the foreign supplier nor the importer control the hazard. It will be the customer of uh, the importer. So what do you do then? Well, understanding the rule and the Harpsit rule, well, it says that now I, as an importer, I must let my customer and I must obtain on an annual basis from the customer a written assurance. It's a legal document that states, 
look, I do have what it takes to eliminate. I have the processes, I have the programs, I have the records, I have the documentation, and so on, uh, to make sure that 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 uh, commodity or that product uh, is subject to the necessary control. I make a lot of emphasis on that because under FISMA, now we have for the first time a truly integrated farm to fork food safety system. So you need to go back one, maybe two steps before you, and you may have to go forward one, at least one step to assure that we are aware of a hazard associated with a product and that somebody will have the right control in the system. Okay, so on the next one, okay, there is a question here. If radiological, okay, anybody, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we can take care of them later. Yeah, there's quite a few questions of Mark, so we'll leave them. Okay, later. okay, we'll, we'll go for them later. Okay, fine. Uh, then again, based on based on the risk evaluation, then you must then uh, set up those verification activities. Okay, which ones will they be? With what frequencies are you going to do it? The procedures to do it. Who will do it? Again, this must be done by a qualified individual. Okay, and the verification activities are. There's nothing new. A verification activity could be an on-site audit of your foreign supplier. It could be sampling and testing of the Ford product by your foreign supplier and sending you a COA with each lot. It could you, you could do your own sampling and audit of each lot, or periodic lot. Uh, review with certain frequencies of the different records that must be maintained by your foreign suppliers. Like you, you may want to ask, I, I want to see the records for the last three lots. Uh, uh, as related to the kill step or the or the identified the preventive controls, so you have a mix and and match of those things. For example, you could have a verification activity that says, "I will have a COA with every lot," or you could say the most critical verification activity for me will be the annual on-site audit and periodic COAs. Okay. And so you will have to define what that mix will be and the frequency and how to carry them out. Now, this is very critical, this slide. If the hazard analysis identify a Sakoda hazard, and a Sakoda hazard means one capable of creating, of, of, of uh, creating a serious adverse health effect, consequences or death to human and animal, we're talking basically recall one, then you have no choice. That foreign supplier has to be visited initially when you do the risk assessment, and then annually thereafter, they must also be visited. Again, a question may come up, okay, if they are subject to a GFSI scheme, can that audit substitute? Yes, as long as you have it in writing where in that scheme this is taken care of, okay? Then you could use that annual audit as your as your evidence that you have done that activity, okay? The next slide then uh, says that certain other inspections can be used uh, uh, rather than you doing your own audit or rather than, than a, a third party, okay? If an FDA inspection took place of a foreign supplier within the year of when you would have taken yours, you could substitute that FDA inspection. Okay, if the inspection is done by the food safety agency in a country that has an equivalent system to the US, then that one can be substituted. Unfortunately, there is only one country on earth that meets those requirements till now, and that's New Zealand. So that's not likely to happen. And also you can ask, what is the likelihood that the FDA will inspect my foreign supplier within those 12 months of where I was supposed to do my audit, okay? Now, you can rely on that documentation, but look at the next to last line. You as the importer, you will be had response. You must review, okay? And you must make the decision, okay? On whether or not that inspection was acceptable, okay? The next slide then, uh, result and verification. And if there are some things, some issues that came up, then the importer is responsible for following up on corrections, corrective actions, and document them that they took place and that they were effective. 
So here we have a question. I hope we everybody can answer real quick because uh, uh, we we made a lot of emphasis. Uh, an importer of food can rely on a third party audit of his supplier as long as the auditor of that third party is independent and what? Yep, just type it in, ladies and gentlemen. Ca carry on with the um, presentation, okay. Cornelius, we'll carry and, on and with the presentation. while they're typing in. Yeah, you yeah. type in the end. Okay. Now, again, I'm going to go with this very quickly. If the hazard analysis it says that the importer is, is responsible or identified as, as the entity who will control the hazard, then the importer has his food safety plan as his or her facility subject, of course, to FDA inspection. And then the next one is if a hazard is controlled by the customer of the importer, then, as I said before, the importer must warn such customer that such an item is not controlled for a, 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 an identified hazard, and that customer must then, once a year, provide a assurances that he or she is doing that, okay? The next slide, then. Cornelius, Cornelius yes, sir. Uh, I'd say 90, 98% have said qualified, so they've been listening. Okay. Okay. <laughs> w w wonderful. <laughs> and that's what we expect, what we expect, okay? If 98% say, you, if I understood you right, are qualified, is that what I understood you say? No, no, they're saying that the missing word was qualified, independent and qualified. Oh, qualified. Okay, independent and qualified. Qualified, qualified, qualified. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> because that is that that is a, an incredible critical definition under the new Part One One Seventeen uh, Current Manufacturing Practice has analysis and risk based revenue for control. Qualified individuals, you must demonstrate that you have the qualifications. Okay. Now, other things that the importer must uh, do is, uh, if there are any complaints about the program, you must follow through and make sure that they take care of. If the supply, uh, the importer becomes aware that the product is adulterated or misbranded, remember we went through that. Okay, it must be handled it immediately. If the FDA goes and, and inspects the, mind you, the FDA can inspect the importer, will ins inspect the importer, and the FDA will inspect foreign supplier. If issues are written up on the Form 483, the importer must handle, must assure that his foreign supplier is handling those. And, and he or she must document all those uh, corrective actions, okay? Now, Periodic evaluation, briefly here, is the same as uh, the Harpsey rule for any food plant in the United States. Minimum every year, you have to go back and see, is this food safety plan that I have for my foreign suppliers, in terms of my foreign supply verification, is it still effective? Or when something happens that make you suspect the effectiveness of a given preventive control or a, a, a combination of preventive controls or when something changes in your foreign supplier. Well, let's assume, you know, uh, one day you're talking to your foreign supplier and your foreign supplier, hey, guess what, uh, Cornelius, we just installed this brand new line, you know, I hope you like the product, you know, you probably won't see any, any changes, but the product is great, it's the same and so on. And I sit here and say, well, wait, wait a minute. How did you do that change without me letting you know? A brand new line, you must have redone your hazard analysis. So that, that would be a, a real bad situation to get into. So, so make sure that if, if news about your new hazard, uh, make sure you know about what's going on in the world, make sure you get, uh, you review the, 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 uh, the red uh, alert imports uh, that the FDA publishes, Look, is the is a import alert being published by the FCA that could very well affect my supplier, though it's it's not related to my supplier and so on. So you 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 must stay tuned to what's going on with food safety worldwide. Now, quick question. And I hope everybody gets it right. Identification of a misbranded food import in regard to allergens. Now again, this is the importer, should lead to immediate what of the product by the importer? Yeah, if you type in, ladies and gents, just type in the missing word, an immediate Type in the missing what. word, and, and, and we'll continue with the seminar, and Simon will let us know uh, who said it right, mm -hmm. okay? It should be clear okay. by now. Now, ID of the importer. Guys, every importer will have to have a unique identifier. 
It could be the if you are facility already identify with the FDA, it could be that. It could be a Dun and Bradstreet number. It could be any number, but it has to be an a unique ID of the importer, okay? And the reason for that is that when you import food, that ID number must be supplied every time you import. So the FDA and Customs and Border Protection, what they want is to link every time something comes in with who is a foreign supplier and who is importing this. That's the only reason for that. Every time you import something. So make sure that uh, you uh, get hold of the FDA and make sure that you do have that unique identification number registered and that must be submitted every time you import a food product, okay? Otherwise, your product will be detained at the import port. The next one, records. Here, there's nothing new, guys. It's the same as the uh, Harpsey rule in the United States, okay? Uh, the foreign supplier verification program with the Harpsey analysis, the verification activities, and so on and so forth, must be in writing. You must do it. If you do it on paper, it's original, original or true copies. You can have an electronic record subject to certain rules and regulations, okay? The uh, must be signed and, and dated by the importer, the foreign supplier verification program, okay, must maintain all the records up to two years after they were created, available to the FDA, okay. So this is a new rule under the Food Safety Modernization Act. The FDA has access, has legal access, open oral or written associated with the manufacturing, uh, packing, and shipping of food, okay? That includes imported food, okay? So, so that those records are subject to review and photocopying if the A so requests, okay? And in domestic facilities, they must be available within 24 hours. Okay, well, so what are you going to do within the 24 hours? Now, what happens if your records are in China? So the FDA want to review records, say in Spanish, made them available to us. They did not speak. But you better be prepared to know who you're going to turn around on this so that you you have to translate and submit records to the FDA, okay? So let's just ask this back, little just, going, just going back, Cornelius, 100% yes, said recall, but some of them were more specific and said recall type 1. Um, yeah, that's that's thing. fine. That's great. Right. Congratulations to all of you. Yes, recall, and it would be a class one in the United States. Yeah, if the product it's already in the market, I imported it, and and I already sent it to customers, or I'm already using it in 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 my product, and uh, and the importer uh, notices by golly, you know, there's a mislabeling. He forgot to put egg. I need to immediately uh, implement my recall program. Okay. Great, congratulations to all of you. Now, how long do you think you're gonna let the FDA wait for your translated records? Okay, let's see who is courageous here. <laughs> we've got, uh, I've been running the poll in the sidebar while you were speaking and we've got uh, five days is about 50%. Yeah. 15 days is 40% and 30 days, let's say 10%. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm glad the majority uh, ha has sensed the urgency there, okay? If you have a food safety issue, do you think the FDA is going to wait 30 days? I don't think so, okay? So <laughs> the sooner you make those records available in English, the better, okay? So that's all I can say because they don't... Uh, you, you, ...you can have, okay? Then here, very quickly, modified requirements for certain things. So if you are importing dietary supplements or dietary supplement components, they are very specific regulations for those. Then you 
must apply those under your foreign supplier verification program, okay? For very small importers or very small foreign suppliers, uh, that is defined in the rule in terms of uh, the value of, the, of, of what are you importing or exporting. Uh, if I remember right, it's under $1 million uh, average over three years and so on. If you feel you feel you, 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 I am a small exporter, I mean foreign supplier or importer, then you need to really look and let your legal counsel take a good look at that because you must provide the FDA with such evidence on an annual basis and then you will be subject to modified requirements. And then the last one we already talked about, the only country that meets those requirements is New Zealand. And hopefully, as the years go by, other countries will have that benefit as well. Okay. And then very briefly, if you don't comply this, and remember the, 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 that that deadline is May 2017, you know, it's, it's a prohibited act and you will be subject to sanctions and criminal prosecution. So you don't want to be subject to that. So let's get going really quick and, and get this thing started among importers and, and, and foreign suppliers so that we are as close as we can to compliance within the next 18 months. So again, a brief review, you have roughly through May of 2017 to come into compliance. I, I assure you that there will be thousands that will not be, but we don't want to be one of those, okay? We, we really truly want to aim at being in compliance with that. So what are the challenges? How can we approach this, okay? So make sure that whether you're an importer or a foreign supplier, you become available. You can download it from the app that would like to with with uh, with an app. Uh, you glad to share with you. This is not an official version, but a document of that. Okay thing is become aware of it and set up a transition team. How are we going to transition to this, guys? For a lot of you guys, an importer, you probably are doing a lot of this already. It's just to verify that what you do does comply with this section, that section, that numeral of the rule, okay? Now, for some others, it will take a little bit more to come into compliance, but set up a transition team to from us and are we not or are, are we complying with that and being able to check it off okay then for some of you well we will have to undertake and make a risk assessment okay uh, agree on the right verification activities and why we want to have it and with what frequency okay? records that we will maintain to program is adequate document and finally and train personnel and now you see it's qualified individual the part 117 of the FISMA act okay but when you say a, a qualified individual means the differences in what is a qualified individual they are basically four types the, the the most basic type is a qualified individual on the floor, manufacturing, holding, packing, processing food, okay, line operator. They must be qualified for food safety as in terms of their jobs, okay? So you have generic training in basic GMP sanitation, practice, personal practice and so on, but wait a minute, charge of this, Specific training of food must have that position must have advisory level qualify as what thing I must be able to do to demonstrate that the qualified individuals are carrying out their assigned duties as far as food safety is concerned in an effective manner. Think monitoring, think verification activity, think validation, think calibration, think uh, records review. And a lot of you will say, we're already doing that. Great, congratulations. Just verify that 
That is part of your education and training program. And then comes a PCQI, that that is thing that will be have facility. An importer will have to do it. The form because this is the person that will be or developing the program, program and managing the program. This this PCQI, but you must have access to such qualifications. Okay, and then the final one we already talked about a qualified auditor. Again, a qualified audit is defined as the person who has the appropriate training and experience to carry out this type of, of audit. So be careful with that and make sure you have the right qualified individual, okay? And then the next stop, just develop timelines, make a, a gun chart for you guys and set up regular meetings like we're having today and make sure that you progress at the graduate space towards May 2017 and hopefully by then you will have a very good, effective uh, foreign supply verification program. Now, the last thing there is guidance document. The, the FDA promised us a lot of guidance document. Very few have come out, but there is a link to the FDA that you want to make sure you have it. If you don't know about it, ask us. We'll, we'll be glad to send it to you where they, all, they, they update you about all the guidance documents out there, but they especially update about the new ones coming in. Use them because they're very prescriptive, okay? And you want to make sure that you are somehow uh, meeting those prescriptions, okay? So um, that takes us to the last poll, I think. Uh, I wonder how many of you guys, uh, and be true about it, okay? <laughs> Truthful about it. Uh, ready to go, eager to go, can't wait to get it implemented. <laughs> okay. And while uh, Simon sets up that poll, if, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you're better off not calling us. You're better off uh, sending us. Okay. And we'll be happy to do our best to answer your questions. Okay. So uh, when you get into infoabiadline.org, the people uh, in charge of that will, will channel it, that question to the pertinent, uh, what we call subject matter experts and, and, and provide you with an answer. Okay. So Not I'm good. at the end of the program. I hope you enjoyed it all. I hope it was useful. Uh, please stay in contact and uh, we're ready for some questions if we have time. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks very, very much for that, Cornelius. Uh, very engaging and uh, interesting and uh, detailed uh, information there you've got across in, in one one hour. So well done. Thanks very much for that. Just to give you the um, results. Thank you for of the, the opportunity. Just, just, yeah, just the results of the poll. 60% uh, <clears throat> are very eager to get stuck into FSVP. 15% are not eager at all. <laughs> and 25% uh, 20, it doesn't apply. They've just come along. Uh, for the for the fun. Well, you're lucky fellas. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dodge that bullet. So at least you've uh, maybe convinced uh, a few more to, to get stuck into that. Uh, and like you say, it's eight, is it 18, 18 months. The, um, they, they, they can't leave it for 18 months. They've got 18 months to really get every, all the ducks in a row. Is that right? Thing in and out, uh, so I didn't yeah, I think uh, we've been having some audio problems um, uh, here and there, but um, can you hear me now, Cornelius? No. I... No. I, I think we, we've been having some uh, issues with the connection from your end, actually. The, oh. The, yeah, the sound was a bit uh, clunky here and there, but um, I think what, what we'll do is we'll We'll try and pick up one or two questions and see how we go. Can you actually hear me, Cornelius? I can hear you right now, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see then. Shan is saying, if you import from exporters that pack fruits and vegetables, must you check all the growers? There could be hundreds. Or rely on gap certifications obtained by exporters for their operations? Okay. What, what do you think? Very complicated uh, question. 
from a supplier in a country and that produce, whether it's the fruits or vegetables, we'll say for, for dozens or a couple of hundred uh, individual producers, then that foreign supplier, you as an importer, you must make sure that he has, say, a good agricultural program or that he, that his growers do have the equivalent of the produce, uh, of, of the produce rule in the United States. So, because Remember, you are responsible for importing that product to the United States. So go back to the foreign supplier and assure that he or she is applying the right things at their facility as well as the right good agricultural practices slash produce rule at their farms. Okay, thank you. Um, you've got a little, uh, um, let me see. Oh, Vicky's saying, so the unique ID is the ID of the importer, including the number of the... Again. Cons uh, Vicky is asking, is the unique ID the importer, including the number of the consignee agent? Is that, does that oh, make oh, sense? Oh, I, 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 you were cutting in and out, but was the question about the... The ID, the ID number of the importer whether whether you are the owner whether you are the agent yeah um, the FDA. yeah i think we, we the, the sounds cutting in and out uh, i think what we'll have to do is we'll have to pick up these questions collate yeah. them and see if we can answer these afterwards is that a good uh, idea yeah but please please do so uh, if we can write down all the questions and we will make sure to those back to them okay all right then Connie this uh, on behalf on behalf of myself and the attendees IFSQN and all the attendees today thanks very much for for this I will collate all the questions and send them over to you and then we'll see if we can get some answers okay thank you very much thank you all and good luck and uh, I know you will be successful okay right Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm sorry for some of the sound issues there. We'll have to see what the recording comes out like as well. Um, maybe uh, it, it, it might be better on the recording. We'll see. Uh, but hopefully you got uh, plenty out of it as it was. Um, I've loaded your certificate in the sidebar for uh, the last couple of weeks. It's crashed the website. You all trying to download it at the same time. But if not, if it does have problems again today, don't worry, because we'll be following up uh, within 24 hours with an email with the recording, the slides, and a copy of the certificate. We'll send you all that. So don't worry if you can't get it now. As I said, there's no Food Safety Fridays next week, but we have got the um, vulnerability and threat analysis um, four-hour seminar next week. So get in touch or, uh, if you want to register for that. All I have to say is uh, thanks for attending today. Um, have a lovely weekend. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. And we'll see you at the next Food Safety Friday. So take care. Thank you.